Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, updating you on the latest government plans for a UK single trade window, brought to you by the Institute of Export and International Trade. My name is William Barnes Graham, the Executive Editor at the Institute, and I will be your host for this afternoon's webinar. And it's going to be a slightly different format to normal, with not one, but two panels providing, firstly, an expert's view of the UK's plans for a single trade window, and secondly, the view of businesses about what this will all mean for traders. Next slide, please. Um, so here we'll see uh, that introducing today's uh, webinar, we'll have Kevin Shakespeare, the Institute's Director of Special Projects and International Development. Kevin, great to be with you again. How are you and why is today's webinar so important? Yeah, uh, great to uh, 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 present uh, on this topic um, and good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're well. Um, I, I guess there's been a lot of talk of a UK single trade window. It, it's something we've uh, we've been waiting uh, around the corner to happen. Uh, the reality is it's happening and it's happening soon. So uh, today's webinar is really important in getting your views and ongoing industry outreach and participation. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. As, as Kevin says, it's really about getting you guys to send in your questions, send in your thoughts, and there's a survey we'll talk about later on as well. So a great opportunity for engagement. Uh, Kevin is very much leading the Institute's engagement with government on the single trade window, and we'll be recapping what it is in a few moments with a short presentation. But if, uh, if you'll now see, if you click, um, but we have a, a great panel of experts today. Kevin's going to be joined by John Walden and Tiago Barbosa to start discussing some of the questions you've been sending in. Now, John is the Principal Consultant for Customs Trade Facilitation and Export Competitiveness at Crown Agents, with over three decades of experience in customs and trade. And Tiago joins us from Brazil, Brasilia, I believe, and he has been involved in the development of a single trade window in Brazil. So it'll be really interesting to hear some of his experiences later on as well. On the next slide, we'll then be welcoming a panel of businesses to share their views on the likely impact of the Single Trade Window program on traders. Sylvia Novak joins us from automotive firm Bros Limited, where she is a Senior Customs and Foreign Trade Compliance Officer. Sylvia is also a graduate from the Institute's Diploma in World Customs Compliance and Regulation, so we'll definitely know her stuff when it comes to trade. David Box will be of us too. David is the Advocacy and Duty Optimization Manager at GSK and has over 30 years experience working in supply chain roles and in the pharmaceutical industry. And last, but by no means least, Jane Smith will also be in the business panel. Jane is the Managing Director at Joint Team Products, a small family business internationally successful in manufacturing and exporting. Jane is also an IUE graduate, so again, we'll definitely know her stuff. Uh, on the next slide, though, before handing over to Kevin, we're going to run a quick poll to find out a little bit more about you, our audience. So we just want to get a sense of what your level of understanding is around concepts like the single trade window and the ecosystem of trust. While you are answering that poll, just some housekeeping notes from me. Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions use the question panel onto the control window, usually to the right-hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions today, though please note we cannot guarantee we will get to every question in the allocated time. As such, I'll be prioritizing questions that have relevance to the wide audience, so I won't be going into company or sector-specific queries as such. And please note that if your questions are short and clear, I am more likely to be able to read them. Finally, you will receive access to today's slide pack, as well as a recording of the webinar in a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. So I'll, I'll give you just a couple more seconds to answer that poll. And I will now share the results. So thank you everyone for answering that poll. A quarter of you either have a strong or quite a strong understanding, with 5% of you saying a strong understanding just over a half of you have a weak understanding and again, just under a quarter, no understanding at all. Uh, now, Kevin, this is, this is really interesting because the last time we answered this, we asked this question in August, 
I think it was about the same number of people said they either had a strong or quite a strong understanding. So not much movement there. Is that about tallying with what you're seeing in the industry? Um, I would generally say uh, yes. And, and again, thank you for everybody for answering the poll question. Um, clearly, um, uh, there's a lot more that needs to be uh, done to help understanding, but, but really understanding it in terms of not just the fact that industry has to use a single trade window, but how can an industry actually benefit from using a single trade window? Um, and, and we feel that industry uh, will, will hopefully set the rules for how a single trade window is developed. But uh, uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank you for everyone attending today. It's a really good attendance and thank you to the export, uh, expert panel speakers. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, uh, as said, to everyone who responded to that poll. But now, without any further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to hand over to Kevin, who will briefly recap what a single trade window is and why it could be such a game changer for UK trade. So on the next slide, over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Will. So if we have the next slide, please. Um, I, I will be describing shortly in, in the context of what a single trade window is, but trying to keep it as, as simple and, and as straightforward as possible. But, but let's, let's talk first of all about what's at stake from digital trade. Uh, in a, in a, a major report the Institute uh, uh, undertook in March this year, we indicated that, that digitalizing processes can, can make trade move 90% faster and 60% cheaper. Uh, and that includes exports. It's not just a about the UK border and imports, it's exports and return on, uh, on investments. But also it has opportunities to, to have further benefits such as reduced um, uh, uh, carbon footprint and increased supply chain traceability and, and visi visibility. So there's a lot at stake here. It's not just replacing or, or, or modifying existing systems that we have in, in the UK. There's a lot more at stake in terms of how we, how we reinvent ourselves to trade more efficiently. So here we have, uh, here we have the next slide, please. So what is a single trade window? And it's fair to say when we use the UNC fact recommendation number 33, that that, that is, is probably slightly outdated now. Um, and the ambition for a single trade window needs to be uh, a, a lot stronger uh, than, than, than recommendation 33. So we have an opportunity, as we said, with industry participation, and engagement and outreach to provide so much more. Um, so if we have next, please. So first of all, let's consider the current model for how UK businesses trade, whether you're, you're inputting yourself or you're using an intermediary or freight forwarder, is to effectively uh, input into different HMG systems, HMRC, for example, DEFRA systems. Um, so consequently, you're having to re-input uh, uh, information in multiple times. Uh, and every time you have a, a movement, for example. So that's what you're faced with now, having to, having to key in lots of different information to lots of different systems. Wouldn't it be great if we had this tell us once approach or even tell us never approach by using existing information so it's reused on every shipment? So if we have next, please. So the real concept at the core of a single trade window is that info is, is, is information is just input once. Uh, instead of going into multiple government systems, uh, it, it effectively goes into one system. So this concept of a single trade window. And, th and thereafter, the information goes off to the various um, uh, HMG systems. Clearly, um, uh, that there'll be the customs declaration, uh, that there'll, there'll be requirements for DEFRA, for export health certificates, for IPAS, for pre-notification, home office border force. But th there are other systems. It's not just example. We'll have transit. Uh, we, we have SPIRE for uh, export controls and dual use goods. These are multiple government systems. So the idea is you input once, but once you have that, it's static data as well. And if there is a question, coming back uh, effectively it comes back through the single trade window if clarification is needed so this tell us once and we would go further this tell us never approach to the various HMG systems but through one single trade window if we have a next slide please 
So trade facilitation and compliance. And we feel very strongly at the Institute of Export and International Trade that compliant, legitimate traders should benefit. So if you're compliant, you should benefit from trade facilitation. So trade optimization, but having the time. So uh, uh, businesses, uh, through not having to input into multiple different systems, have the time to deploy resources more effectively for trade op optimization, duty optimization, use of custom special procedures, for example. But compliant traders should have additional trade facilitation benefits. And that's the opportunity we have in a single trade window. It's not just about replacing processes, it's about increasing trade facilitation and trade optimization. So if we have the next slide, please. So yes, there'll be challenges, but also where, where it comes challenges, there are opportunities as well. And some of those opportunities, if we look at, at trace, uh, traceability, validation, accessibility, can come for advanced supply chain information. And that's, that clearly is, is within some of the ecosystem of trust pilots, several of which the Institute of Export and International Trade are involved in, and, 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 and effectively will lead into ecosystem of trust pilots for, for, for different uh, uh, trade routes. But yes, there are challenges, but we would also stress it's not just about technology. We can't just view a single trade window as, a, as, as technology driven. There is so much more the opportunity that the UK has uh, to really facilitate trade, increase provenance, traceability in supply chains as well, and generate economic growth for the UK. If we have the next slide, please. So is it possible? Well, it certainly is. And, and um, uh, uh, Tiago today will, will, will speak more about Brazil. There's, there's, there's a number of examples globally, the likes of Singapore, um, uh, the likes of Kenya. Uh, and I was in Maastricht last week at, uh, at a World Customs Organization event where we heard from speakers from the likes of Pakistan and Ghana as well. So single trade windows are operating globally. Um, and we're also seeing other initiatives in the UK, the introduction uh, uh, recently of the Electronic Trade Documents Bill, the acceptance of electronic documents <clears throat> when that's approved by Parliament. <clears throat> excuse me, the target operating model. These are opportunities, but they all have to work together. Clearly, we can't have silos of single trade window, ecosystem of trust, electronic trade documents bill, target operating model. They all have to work together. If we have the uh, uh, next slide, please. So I, I think I'll, I'll sum up here, but what I also wanted to say, uh, when we think about trade, it's not just about tariff barriers, it's not just about <laughs> inputting into government systems. We have to think about trade as well in terms of technical uh, barriers to trade, non-tariff barriers. So the Institute are, are particularly pleased to uh, notice a partnership, a cooperation with UCAS, which is very much looking at certification standards and the non-tariff barriers as well. Because yes, we, we can make trade easier, but we've also got to cover the non-tariff barriers. So e effectively, what I wanted to, to call out here is that we're very much keen to get your views. Yes, during the poll questions, but also for a short survey as well. You have the opportunity to influence now how a single trade window is developed. And the Institute is here to really hear the voice of industry. And this is everyone in industry, whether you are an importer, an exporter, a logistics service provider, uh, uh, a CSP, a customs broker, and so on, a port operator. We want your views because the only way a single trade window will be most effectively is by uniting the industry, not creating a monopoly, but uniting everything behind the industry. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass back now and thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. And uh... Well, we've we shared the link to the survey in the chat just now, and we'll be sharing that in the email uh, following the webinar as well. So don't worry, you will get uh, the actual link itself in your inboxes. We've moved on to the next slide. We're going to do another poll now. We're just going to ask you what you think the single most important benefit of trade digitalization, both back of your single trade window, the existing of trust, the target operating model. What is the single main benefit for your business and the options? are all on the screen there. 
Kevin, just while people are answering that poll, just back to the survey, I mean, what sort of things are we looking for from businesses in terms of the feedback, uh, the sort of feedback which, which we can take to government on their behalf? Really, what, what, we, what we're looking to try and uh, draw out is what businesses consider the benefits to be, what support businesses need to, uh, to have to use the single trade window. Um, and and any, um, any particular issues or opportunities that, that, that businesses see. So um, it, it's your opportunity. You are the ones heavily engaged in, in business, importing, exporting, uh, moving goods on a day-to-day -day basis. So what, what do you see as the opportunities? What support do you need to maximise use of a single trade window? Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'm just going to close the poll. Once again, thank you, everyone, for responding. Um, so over half of you say speed and efficiency. And I'm very cognizant, by the way, that a lot of these options do overlap, but uh, really interesting insight anyway. So over half of you speed and efficiency, 38% of you reduction of complexity, and then only 7% supply chain visibility, and only 1% reduce carbon footprint. Um, I actually wrote an article about how digitalization will feed into uh, the kind of ESG reporting and, and the move to net zero, which you can find on the website if you want to read um, about that. But really interesting response. Again, thank you everyone for, for that. It actually almost mirrors exactly the same response that we got to this poll when we asked it in July. Uh, when we asked it then, we got 53% again on speed and efficiency, 29% on reduction of trade complexity. Kevin, I, that's not too surprising, is it? No, it's, it, it, it's probably not. And I appreciate for a lot of um, uh, the responses that there is overlap and, 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 and it could be that, that, um, that all areas uh, uh, are important to your business. And also we're interested that for those that other 2%, what you consider that other category to be. What we would stress is, is there, there is interlinked opportunity here. So supply chain visibility through the lights of ecosystem of trust, advanced supply chain data, from as early as possible in the supply chain. So an example we've used a lot at the Institute, a movement from, from uh, Mombasa to, uh, to Great Britain at the moment, uh, it's normally only about 24 hours before that, that HMG will know about it. Under an ecosystem of trust, HMG will know about it before those goods have left Mombasa. So giving them a huge opportunity to, uh, to advance risk. Thank you. And just follow on that, Kevin, just very quickly before we, we bring John and Tiago in. You've mentioned the ecosystem of trust a couple of times. And obviously, you've explained very clearly what a single trade window is. But what do you mean by an ecosystem of trust? Yeah, thank you very much. And um, uh, Will, and, and apologies, I've, I've, I'm trying not to use acronyms and terms here. And I appreciate some, some will be aware, some will not be aware. So it is linked, I guess, the term ecosystem of trust to, to probably one of the most ambitious uh, 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 government initiatives around obtaining information as early as possible in the supply chain. So effectively taking information and data from the likes of the commercial invoice, the packing list, uh, the master bit of lading, but also in some cases from the overseas government department, the, uh, the revenue authority, the plant health authority, for example. And by taking that advanced information, uh, you, 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 you will know about a movement, for example, 40 days before the goods have actually left the country of departure uh, as opposed to 24 hours before currently so that's a huge opportunity to uh, uh, to to take it also looking around this concept of trusted trader i've not gone into that too much today and, and, and so we don't necessarily have the time that compliant traders who are able to provide that advanced data should receive benefit and and, and advanced traders uh, uh, compliant traders should also receive benefit from compliance, which is not just authorised economic operator. Uh, it's also elements of compliance that uh, traders who keep good records, standard operating procedures, uh, are able to demonstrate origin, uh, classification, etc., should benefit. So uh, linked to, if you like, the, the, the movement, the advanced data, is this concept of benefits for trusted trader who are operating legitimately and compliantly. Terrific stuff. And it sounds like a, another few webinars in the near future will be on, on those sorts of topics. We're bringing it back to the single trade window. On the next slide, uh, you'll see we've brought on John and Tiago, who both very kindly joined us to share some of their experiences and their wisdom and insights about the single trade window. 
Uh, John, if I can begin with you, you've been involved with single trade window programs before. Could you say a little bit more about uh, your history and experience with the with the concept? Yeah, thank you very much, William, and, and hi, Kevin. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for inviting me to this. Um, single window, of course, you know, as Kevin said, it's not new. Uh, the first one was in Singapore about 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, again, as, as, as Kevin said, Article 30 or Recommendation 33 is probably very outdated now. So I one of the things and, and this kind of, I guess, links with, with what I do in relation to single window. A key thing to say, of course, is that a single window is not an IT product. It's a trade facilitation tool of which most countries implement it by an IT system. So the side that I tend to get involved in is not the IT side. It's all the hard work that has to go on um, before the IT side can even be thought about. And that's, thing, that's things like business process re-engineering, um, looking at the current business processes, harmonizing information, simplifying everything, and then looking at what stakeholders could be should be involved. And it does tend to be different in different countries. So just a, a really quick example. Last week I was in, in um, I nearly said Singapore, I was in Zimbabwe, where they're starting to look at single window. Um, they couldn't believe that we don't have one in the UK. So one of the one of the first bits really um, is to remind governments that they've got to the single window has got to give a benefit to everyone. Now, when you're talking into about a country where there's good trade facilitation, a standard importer, standard exporter, you know, dealing with a non, um, you know, a non difficult product to a non difficult country, then they'll see very little benefit from single window um, in its most basic form. But in an emerging market, and for example, in Zimbabwe, they had to complete five documents even for the most simple export. There, a single window will have a very, very big impact. So a lot of my work is reminding governments what they have to do in relation to the trade facilitation agreement, um, if they're members of the WTO, because they've got no option, and really advisory on some of the basics. Um, for example, in Nigeria, they were looking at having a single window for their regulatory requirements and a port community system. And, you know, we had to tell them, actually, you then end up with a double window. That's not a single window. That is actually a double window. So let me pause there. It's not the IT side I look at. It's everything else that goes into making a single window give a benefit to all types of cross-border trader. Thank you, John. That sounds a really important point. I'm just picking up on the WTA facilitation agreement, and I'm just thinking for the broader audience. Can you say a little bit more about what that is and, and what that means? What, what, what business need to know about that? Certainly. Thanks. Thanks very much, William. Um, the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement, it's actually a re I always say it's the trade, the most important trade agreement that no one's ever heard of. Um, it was signed in 2017, much, much earlier than anyone thought, because every country which was a member state of the WTO real realized the importance of it. So in the trade facilitation agreement, there are 12 or 13 articles, um, and there are over 70 uh, requirements that governments have to bring in. And those are things like, actually a single window isn't a compulsory requirement, it's a recommendation. But it's also things like benefits to compliant traders like AEO schemes. It's about digitalization of trade in general. It's about one-stop border posts instead of having to let lots of border checks at land crossings. It's about transit arrangements. It's about testing arrangements. Really, the whole agreement is about bringing transparency and efficiency into international trade. Um, important thing to say is, whilst most of the WTO work is about tariff barriers and standards, the trade facilitation agreement is all about the non-tariff barriers, easing the non-tariff barriers globally. Thanks, John. And just before we come on to Tiago, we've had a really good question in from uh, Sophie, who asks, uh, do currently operational single trade plat uh, window platforms tend to include all cross-border trade documentary requirements, such as commercial and origin documents, or is it just regulatory requirements? 
Well, that's a really good question and actually one of my pet subjects, um, or pet, pet topics, I should say. Actually, most single windows are only regulatory requirements. And that's not surprising because when you look at Recommendation 33, um, you know, and to an extent the trade facilitation agreement, it does refer to bringing together, you know, government agencies and government departments. So basically, um, in most cases, it's regulatory requirements. Now, my view is in the 21st century, that doesn't go nearly far enough. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier on, um, it's very, very true to say that if you look at a developed country, an OECD country, a standard exporter or importer will notice no difference from the um, single window. And the reason is because, you know, all they've got to do is make an import declaration or an export declaration. It's not more complicated than that. But when you, you know, I think the concept now should be single window should be for everyone. It should be a trade facilitation tool for everyone. But if you're going to achieve that, then you've got to be um, really, really heavy, I think, on bringing in, as the questioner, the questioner asked, the commercial documents, the origin documents for preference and non-preference origin, maybe even banking documents to sort out, you know, letter of credit requirements and things like that. That's not easy. It definitely isn't easy. But I think for an OECD country, having a single window that only combines or only brings together regulatory, regulate, regular, I can't say the word, regulatory processes, then really a lot is a lot of potential is being lost there. Um, so yeah, I think that probably answers that. Thank you, John. Yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful of that word. I have to say it far too often on these webinars. Um, but I saw Tiago nodding along there, so I think it's a good time to bring you in. I mean, you've been involved with the development of a single window in Brazil. Could you say a little bit more about it and and kind of why what John was saying there tallies with, with I assume, your experience? Uh, okay. Um, thank you, William. Uh, first, I want to uh, thanks for the invitation from the Internet Institute of Export uh, in, in the in name of Kevin, you, William, and it's a good opportunity here to show the experience that Brazil is having with the implementation of the single window. And speaking after Kevin and John is going to be really difficult because Kevin did a really good uh, definition about single window and uh, in a very simple way that's difficult to explain how what is a single window in a in a in a simple way and John saying about how is the perspective how we initiate the concept of the single window and now what we are thinking about single window in the world in the in the year 2022 it's a lot of difference and maturity levels that we are talking about so I am involved in Brazil single window project since the beginning in 2014. I work in the foreign trade secretariat here in Brazil. Uh, and I started in the single window project as IT leader. And since 2018, I became the single window general manager. So now I have to deal not only with the IT challenge, but also with the process redesign, integration of the government agencies to the single window, the legal framework updates and of course budget and like Kevin just said that it's not only a system the system is just the point of the iceberg it's where the 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 imported and exported and other uh, traders actors interact but there is a lot to do before it and we have before doing in developing the system we have to redesign the process and reveal all the legislation so you can build and develop a single window system that is efficient and runs a, a, a good way to export and import in the country. And Tiago, obviously 2014 as when it, it kind of initially happened in Brazil, so quite a few years ago now, what can what were the main challenges and lessons uh, which you which you kind of uh, you, you made in that process and particularly thinking from a, a UK perspective in terms of things we can learn over here? Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I want to emphasize is that in the beginning of the single window project, we had a lot of help from the UK through the Prosperity Fund uh, to learn about data harmonization for single window 
and how the PCS environment worked in UK. We we were at Felix Toe and other ports here. Let I have a a book here from Felix Toe. We were there and learning a lot about a single window environment. PCS is a single window environment, a single submission portal. And you can see in the U UNC FACT recommendations, uh, the recommendation 37 or 41, John, you can help me, I cannot remember, but it's the single submission portal. And they talk about the PCS as a single submission portal. You have different kinds of single, single submission portals, single windows in different views. And the actual challenge is to integ integrate a lot of the single window that are being created. So now you don't have only one single window, you have multiple single windows and you have to think about uh, only a single window and integrate all of them. And now we have the concept of national single window. So um, for me, what happened in Brazil and the critical success factor for the single window project is the public and the private partnership that we created. In Brazil, we defined that the single window main goal were the time and cost reduction for the private sector. It's focused on the private sector. And how we could achieve that? The private sector was who defined the new process to import and export in Brazil. And us, as the government, just developed the single window system and update the legal framework to meet those needs those needs and why we did that because for us the private sector is the expert in the cross-border trade so we realized that we should listen from the experts like you in the institute of export is doing to be the connection between the private sector needs and the government uh, and with this strategy since the beginning of the single window project in brazil we reduced it eight days in the time for export and imports. So due to this time reduction, um, the private sector in Brazil is saving $20 billion per year according to the WTO studies. It's a lot of, like Kevin said, uh, the non-tariff barriers uh, is much more expensive than the tariff, tariff barriers and it's a, a invisible cost. So we have to work all together, government, um, private sector, logic service providers to achieve this reduction of time and cost in the foreign trade. Um, that's it. And I want to thank you very much for the questions, William. No, thank you, Tiago. That was really interesting. I mean, 20 billion in, in savings is, is huge. And we're in, in the UK at the moment, we're hearing all sorts about uh, efficiency savings throughout government and so on. And it seems like a, a system like this has a huge role to play in that, really, um, particularly in a post-Brexit where everything is still adjusting. I mean, Kevin, I just wanted to bring you in at this point because some things Tiago says, was saying there really tally with the things you've been saying a lot recently around that government um, business industry partnership and also the importance of interoperability between all the systems. I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about kind of what you take from the, from the Brazilian example in terms of the UK context. Yeah, so again, firstly, thank you, John. Thank you, uh, 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 Tiago. A, a few things really struck me there. Clearly, there was the private sector involvement in Brazil, which is absolutely essential. And, and, and when we say private sector, again, we but clearly that means importers, exporters, but it means every actor in that supply chain. So everybody has to work together to, to, to make this work. All logistic service providers, intermediaries, uh, uh, poor community systems, and so on. And we would stress is the private sector is the expert, exactly as Tiago says. So getting your views and, and putting them in, in, a, in a coherent way is really, really important. So at the Institute, we are establishing an, in, uh, an industry panel around uh, a single trade window. If anyone is interested in, uh, in, uh, in uh, 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 participating, please let me know. Uh, my email address is kevin at export.org. 
uh, uh, don't necessarily uh, uh, expect a response from me straight away because I, I hope to be inundated with emails. Uh, we already have um, a, a number of industry involved, but we want to involve the whole of industry. As, as I've sort of said, a single trade window will only work through industry involvement. It will not work solely through technology. It will only work if everybody works together in a united manner. Thank you, Kevin. And also, we've posted the link to the survey already, which is probably the, the best way of getting in contact with us with your views. But uh, Kevin is, is a hero when it comes to email. He's surprisingly responsive for someone who is so heavily inundated with them. So uh, a, a bit of praise, uh, I think, is uh, required. Um, I'm very conscious we want to get to some use, more user questions. So we had a uh, Bahoom's actually asked a couple. Well, I'm only going to ask one. Uh, he asked, or she, uh, apologies, uh, is it is the UK single trade window going to be open to other single windows in the world? Uh, will it process transactions with other countries via this window? Uh, John, do you want to take that one? Yeah, thanks very much, William. Really interesting question. Um, the answer is, um, at some stage, it will have to interlink with other single windows. Um, the only reason I say, or the reason I say that is because that's another element of the WTO trade facilitation agreement. It's the globally networked customs requirement. So at some stage, there'll have to be connectivity. Personally, I think that that's um, quite a long way away. You know, governments don't like sharing information. That That's a reality. I think it's fairly straightforward, dare I say it, to get bilateral agreements between two countries to share information. I mean, Kevin gave the example of Kenya and the UK. Um, but I think to have generally open network is actually pretty difficult. And of course, one of the realities with a single window is that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, if you start to bring in a plethora of stakeholders, as I think you should eventually, then you have even more problems with sharing uh, relevant information. So there are issues there. So, um, what you do get, of course, uh, you know, we're talking about a national single window. It's actually quite interesting. For some reason in the UK, we're calling it the, the single trade window. That is unique. Um, normally it's called single window, national single window or regional single window. So if you look at Southeast Asia, they have the ASEAN regional single window where they do have a regional connectivity. Um, so a long answer to the question, but in short, currently, I think at a first stage, there won't be a great deal of international linkage amongst single windows, but I think that's a very, very important thing that, that will be on the way as a requirement of the trade facilitation agreement. Can, can yeah, okay. I do uh, I speak here also, William? Uh, it's really good what John is saying. Me, as a single window manager, Brazil single window manager and a UN CFACT expert, we fight a lot about this concept of interoperability. Now, in the WTO, we are having a discussion in the JSI e commerce. And in the JSI e commerce, we have the Digital Trade Facilitation Group. And in this, in this group, Brazil already um, is, is the proponent about papers about single window interoperability, paperless trading, and about trace and track and traceability of cargo. So it's that what we are saying about. We have not only facilitate the, the trade from the border to inside, but exchange data. So we're gonna achieve a next level uh, of trade facilitation. And what Brazil is doing, it's also inside the Mercosur, we already exchanging data about customs declaration, transit declaration, AEO um, companies, um, about certificate of oranges, uh, eFITO, and all of kind of these documents to exchange and have prior uh, information and the possibility of risk management prior their arrival. Thank you, Tiago. Thank you, John. It sounds, the regional stuff sounds really interesting, particularly if you're a UK company wanting to do trade with a Mercosur country and you, then you get that single window for that region. That seems very beneficial. If only the UK was itself part of some sort of regional uh, aspect there, but uh, no comment uh, further needed. Uh, very conscious of time. I just want to do one last question um, from a user. Uh, Roger and Lee have both asked about export control information and whether a single window 
would include export control information. Uh, Kevin, do you want to take that one? Yeah, and I think in, in simple uh, simple answer, it has to. So effectively, the, in, the, in this tell us once or tell us never approach, um, <clears throat> is is that the information for uh, uh, export controls, for example, for OGLs, or Open General uh, 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 Export Licenses, uh, it should definitely be included as well. And again, this is why we, we very much want to hear is, is that some of the initial focus, I guess, for for uh, 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 strategic releases in the UK, maybe focused around uh, around the customs side, uh, around the Home Office Border Force side, and, and clearly around DEFRA as well, is that it has to include absolutely everything. So that for, for businesses to really benefit, it has to include this. Uh, the, 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 obviously, the uh, the concept of export controls, what we know today as a, a, a spire uh, in it. And, and again, we would very much welcome expertise from industry and feedback and join in our industry panel if, if you are involved for example in dual use goods CITES would be another one as well uh, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, excise goods and so on and so forth well at this stage speaking of businesses uh, I think it's time we should we should swap over so I want to say once again thank you to John and Tiago uh, for joining us today those answers have been absolutely fantastic and some really useful insight there so I hope everyone's found that useful and thank you both of you uh, for joining I'm now just going to launch. Thank you. I'm now just going to launch uh, another poll just while we're doing the handover. Uh, so this question is asking you: Would you consider inputting data directly into a single trade window? Uh, Kevin, do you want to explain what we mean by this question a little bit as people are answering it? Yeah, and and, and people may sort of consider this, I guess, from an international uh, perspective as as different things. Sometimes it's been referred to as direct entry, uh, uh, self serve, and 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 other aspects. So, I, I guess again, not just to think about this just purely in the context of customs declaration. Clearly, that is important, but but also as as much you know, advanced supply chain data and 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 so on. The information required for sanitary and phytosanitary uh, export controls is it th th this ability to put input directly into the system yourself uh, and, and again that, that, that can be various actors in, in, in the supply chain it's not just importers and exporters and, and again what we're stressing here the industry will have to work together to, to actually maximize the opportunity from a single trade window so would you consider inputting uh, the data directly in yourself thank you uh, fantastic. So we've had 42% people voted. Uh, so I'll give you just a couple more seconds. Um, hope that explanation has helped. So I'll do a little countdown. Three, two, one, and I will share the results of the poll. Uh, this is quite striking. So 83% of you uh, say yes, you would consider inputting it directly into the single window. 1% of you wouldn't, really interesting. That's a very low number, and 16% of you not sure. Uh, thank you everyone for answering that poll, but uh, conscious of time, it's my delight now to welcome on our business panel. Uh, so we have uh, David, Jane, and Sylvia, and I'll start with a question for Sylvia and Jane, because both of you work for smaller businesses, SMEs, uh, albeit in different sectors. So I'm just interested to hear a little bit more about what you each see as the biggest benefit of the single trade window for your business and I'll start with Sylvia if that's okay. Yeah um, hi everyone thanks for having me. Um, so uh, in regards to the biggest benefits um, definitely the fastest uh, sorry the faster clearance and goods release um, is the biggest biggest benefit um, especially on our time critical um, shipments. Um, less delays means less supply chain challenges for the businesses. It makes a lot of sense and that tallies with the poll earlier as well. I mean, Jane, is it similar for yourself as well, a slightly different sector, or Sylvia being in automotive and yourself being in uh, manufacturing? Uh, no, very similar. I think uh, we're a small family business and it's quite accepted. You have to be a master of everything with a, a very small resource. So the simplification of this, uh, it's massive. The ability to key once or not at all. Um, I can't even begin to describe the relief it would bring to a small business like ours. It has the concept, if it's done right, to be absolutely amazing. That ties with a point Kevin was saying earlier. It's, it's about obviously the non tariff barriers, but it's creating more access to trade for more SMEs, isn't it? Particularly at a time when 
SME exports have been really decimated. That's really important, isn't it, Jane? It is, absolutely is. I think there's a, a certain complexity to systems as they are, especially when you are small, perceived barriers, a lot of information you have to know. So this has the opportunity to, to reduce all of that and make trade far more accessible to small businesses. And, and to you both, I guess, Sylvia first, I mean, can you say just a little bit more about some of those challenges, some of those just, you know, the complexities you're having to deal with at the moment? Can you give some examples, perhaps? Yes, of course. Um, so I have come across some stoppages at the IPF on the GB exports and due to some confusion around the CSC, the custom supervised exports and the transit activation, um, like uh, refusing the T1 to the drivers and demanding the GMR. Uh, now, um, the single trade window um, will make border force and HMRC departments to communicate quickly um, with each other. Um, so we are hoping uh, these, um, uh, there will be less confusion um, regarding custom specific processes. And Jane, how about yourself? Can you give some examples of challenges you face in, in particular? Yeah, well, we've got an accounting software system that can't produce a, a proper commercial invoice as yet. So we're having to modify documents right from the outset, but rekeying into, um, as John pointed out, into EUR1 certificates of origin. Uh, we have to tell people when we book transport the data again. We have to rekey into gross mass statements for the weights. All of that, if you can do it once, you can see straight away the efficiency it will create. Thank you. Thank you both. And, and David, to bring you in, obviously you're, you're coming from a larger company in GSK. Um, is it the same sort of problems you face or, or is it slightly different in a larger company because you have more resource uh, to handle some of these challenges? Yeah, th th thanks, Will. And thanks to you all for the invitation today and the opportunity to represent large businesses, uh, as, as you mentioned. So such as ours, like global healthcare companies, um, I guess, we have a, a complex supply chains across multiple entities, trading partners, etc. The intermediary side of things, to, to, to touch on what you were saying, um, uh, yeah, we, we will be looking for sort of clarification from, I, th I think, from uh, uh, the facilitation benefits that the single trade window will offer. And we're very, very grateful for uh, to webinars such as these, um, partnerships with bodies like yourselves that really help to address these these issues. Uh, by being the link between uh, industry and government, as you, as you clearly are. Uh, I guess it was interesting to see the poll results earlier that we saw um, from the from the highlighting the kind of reduction in complexity in import export activities, um, as well as around speed and, and efficiency. And we would certainly be hoping uh, hoping for, for for some of those benefits uh, uh, as well. Um, and just touching on one other thing, just just briefly, well, I know I know Kevin uh, mentioned earlier about about trusted trader scheme. Um, what we'd be looking really for is around clarity around that and, and around how companies, how that will be incorporated into the single trade window, um, especially around kind of fundamental trade compliance areas uh, and comparing trusted trader with, for example, uh, AEO, as Kevin mentioned. Um, I remember on a previous IO, IOE webinar, um, a, a trader put forward their reservations about perhaps not being able to attain full AEO accreditation and, and, and whether that would have an impact on their ability to be able to use a single trade window. And that's an, an, another area that, that, that we would be very interested in exploring as well. I mean, I wonder, Kevin, if it's a good time to bring you in, because you've heard from smaller companies, there's the challenges just around for the sheer amount of complexity which smaller businesses have to deal with, even though they don't necessarily have the team set up for dealing with it. But then the larger companies worrying about what level of facilitation would be needed in order to make the most of their single trade window. I mean, what do you say to both kind of those slightly different concerns? Yeah, so again, thank you to uh, to Sylvia, Jane and, and David for some really excellent points. Uh, I think I took a couple of things out that, that this is not just about importing and exporting as we know, it. it's also about wider supply chains. And, 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 and again, uh, uh, supply chains are not always as straightforward as a, as a direct import or, or a, uh, a direct B2B. There are so many different actors in, in, involved in international supply chains. So it certainly, certainly took that away. Also took away, if you like, around the further opportunities that single trade window can, can bring. Uh, Jane re referred to, if you like, 
uh, accountancy platforms and, and uh, accounts payable, uh, accounts receivable and so on, and the need to actually link and take data from its earliest possible source and information. So that's really important as well. And we also think even you know, in uh, thinking about the, uh, the Pakistan trade window as an example and, and also many others, is the, is the need to involve banks, for example, from the point of view of trade finance. We don't always think of it. The need to involve um, uh, 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 insurance, cargo insurance, for example. The need to involve freight forwarders as well. So it's interesting how other uh, single trade windows globally have been built out, just beyond, if you like, some some some, some more of the other, uh, other systems to involve industry as well, and not just government departments. So again, if you're if you're for a bank insurance company or freight forwarder, please don't hesitate to contact us and 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 get involved because there's major major benefits. Turning to David's point around trusted trader, it's a really, really good point because even you know, we, we, we make an assumption that AEO is easier for large businesses and really difficult for, for small businesses. Uh, but th th there, are, there are different issues for different sizes of companies depending on, on the number of, say, warehouses, legal entities and so on. Uh, and, and how complex their, uh, 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 their supply chains are back to the original source of origin, for example. So what we, what we really want to see is come back to this point of compliance around what does a trusted trader scheme look, at, uh, look like? Uh, can, can businesses demonstrate what compliance looks like in practice? And if they can, can businesses receive benefits for that compliance? on an ongoing basis and here we have the opportunity to link trade for um, again you say trade compliance trade facilitation single trade window but we've got to make sure that every every different type of business can benefit from it thank you thank you thank you kevin and i mean just bringing it back to i think you were saying earlier about the amount of potential stakeholders who are involved in in any supply chain here who, who will have a vested interest in the single window but one of the concerns which were, was raised in the slides earlier was around data security, uh, data privacy. I'm just wondering from, from the businesses on, on the panel today, kind of what's your view and what do you, do you share those concerns about data security uh, in the development of a single window and what would you like to see in the build of it to, to I guess, allay those concerns? I don't know if you want to go, uh, I'm seeing it on my screen, David, Jane, Sylvia, if we do it that order. So David, do you want to start on data security? Yeah, no, thank, thank you, Will. And I, th I thought uh, the point John made earlier about the fact that we're now going to be going beyond just perhaps simple import-export declarations, and that in order to kind of get the f to, to be able to realise the full fac facilitations and efficiencies of the single trade window, that opens it up to potentially a, a lot more a lot more data um, uh, that, that, that the government will need to see, or or the, or the various parties of the single trade window would need to see um, and, and clearly in a lot of instances some of that data might be commercially sensitive across the, the long the whole extent of the supply chain so we will be very very keen to to understand how 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 that's going to be addressed from the point of view of of keeping that privacy and and and, um, and, and access to that data you know controlled thank you Jane is there a similar concern for you or for, for yourself Yes, it is a concern, but to some extent, we've been already been keying a lot of data into HMRC over the years anyway. Um, I, I feel like the government gateway is a good way to progress. It might not be the right way in the long term, but initially, everybody has to have a secure sign in, potentially two-factor authentication. Um, the former civil service days when I, when I worked there strikes me that there are systems that allow um, an audit to show who's logged into accounts so that if there were a breach of data at any point you would have some sort of visibility inbuilt as to who had been accessing the information which might help it's, it's very complex clearly um, but i think we've got to start somewhere the benefits of this so outweigh the problems i'm certain of it that was a really good point actually obviously government gate with we all have to use the government systems already. There's already lots of private data on there, so it's it's hardly an unprecedented challenge. But Sylvia, do you have anything to add on on, on this point? Um, just to reflect on uh, Jane's point, um, exactly the same um, goes for us. Um, basically, um, the data must be secure, full stop. Um, however, um, we were already engaged in some data processing um, on imports and exports, um, so. 
um, it's really interesting how uh, that data will be um, protected um, once inputted into a single trade window. Thank you, thank you everyone. I've got a few more minutes, so uh, I'm going to come back to the panel in a, in a minute just because there's a, a, a question I want to finish on. But Kevin, just a couple of user questions uh, in the meantime. Uh, we had a question from uh, Malgor Zata, I hope I've said that correctly. Uh, how do custom special procedures fit into the, the single trade window? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good good question. I would say that they fit in in, in several ways. They are a, a, a trade maximization duty ma uh, duty maximization. So again, uh, how special procedures operate within within a single trade window is important. So again, this opportunity of, of tell us once, tell us never, if the static data is there. We also have the opportunity uh, with the likes of the electronic trade documents bill to, to have more electronic documents and less paper documents. But perhaps, mo perhaps most of all, or certainly equally of all, is this opportunity to look how we manage uh, 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 authorizations and special procedures as well. So uh, how much documentation, how much paperwork is needed uh, 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 around release, how much we use this concept of trusted trader, again, for, for benefit uh, for businesses that operate um, uh, efficiently. We have this opportunity to look at, again, special procedures in terms of the authorization process, can we automate the authorization process? So you're, you're reusing data in the authorization process um, and, and then um, uh, how you release, how your evidence release and, 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 and the type of documentation. So authorizations have a, uh, and special procedures have a key part of this. And again, by working with industry, we can work out what is best for, for, for industry. So in our industry panel, we, we, we will be setting up various streams and certainly custom special procedures and authorizations will be one of those. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, we had a question in from Marie who asked, has, gov well, has government, I assume, decided how the trusted trader status will be allocated to GB importers? Um, I, I guess on that, we, we are obviously waiting for the target operating model there. Uh, and, and then as to whether that has the concept, if you like, of tiers of trusted trader. Um, uh, and, 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 and there's various considerations there that, that need to be taken into account. So there is a linkage with, with ecosystem of trust and advanced supply chain data as well, which is not just the UK. It's becoming very much a global uh, uh, a phenomenon wherever you talk. Uh, 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 Tiago mentioned it, for example, this, this risking, the clearance of the goods, whether it's in, in Mercosur, in the, in the East African community and so on, is this uh, advanced supply chain data. So we have to, again, you know, consider it slightly differently than, than it's just a straightforward import to what is the wider picture on the information as well. Uh, we do have to wait for the sort of target operating model. And, and you know, we did hold a, a webinar on that uh, fairly shortly, but and we'll, we'll be holding uh, further uh, 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 webinars. But again, it all has to be integrated. We can't have single trade window, ecosystem of trust, target operating model, electronic trade documents and so on. Uh, new, new, new transit arrangements, they've all got to work and link together. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. I'm going to do one more question for the panel and then come to, back to Kevin for a final question at the end because uh, we've got one more poll, so I'll do that during then. But to the panel, I mean, we've Kevin's been saying a, a fair bit during this webinar, this is very much about a, and actually Tiago John did as well, it's this business to government partnership, which is what's really important. But as a, as a business uh, kind of representative here, what is the one thing you would most like to see from the government in the development of the single trade window? What what the thing would would you yeah, most want them to prioritise? Uh, and if we go in the reverse order, I'll start with Sylvia, Jane, then David. Um, so I think um, very important concept um, for us would be about um, the transit to actually be able to launch it um, electronically, as um, Kevin um, mentioned earlier about um, the system integration. So one system talks to the single tray window. Um, so I think that's very important, um, as well as um, the facilitation of um, the custom special procedures. Um, I'm wondering how is, uh, for example, the CFSP um, imports are going to work, how the SFDs, the simplified frontier declarations and the supplementary declarations are going to be um, uh, lodged into the system. So um, also, um, you know, 
in general, um, the, uh, being able to be authorized for um, using such um, important um, customs um, special procedures that would be, well, we are hoping the, the whole process will be just easier um, to apply and, and get that sort of authorization. Really strong answer. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. And, and Jane? Yeah, I think simplification is the key to keep it as simple as possible and user friendly so that people aren't having to reach for guides to work out what codes to put into the system. Um, I've only used a, a tell us once system in a bereavement capacity, but it was so straightforward. There was a checklist of what do you need before this process starts. And quite clearly, if you'd worked down that checklist, um, it all went through really, really efficiently. So something similar. Um, before you start this process, this is what you must need to know, these numbers you must have, um, and make it easy for us to do. Trade relies on smaller businesses. This is where the country gr grows its roots from. It's small businesses like ours getting to be internationally successful. So as few barriers as possible would be very welcome. Absolutely endorse that. Very strong point. Thank you, Jane. And, and David? Yeah, thank you. Well, I guess not, not wishing really to finish on a bit of a negative, but it's something I don't think we've we've kind of broached today really in much detail, and that's around uh, errors and risk of errors. So I guess we'd want to be really clear that um, risk of errors and sort of user liability and responsibility across the supply chain, I guess especially in instances where, where traders may use intermediaries and, and, and third parties, that will be an area that we that, that we would want to see really clearly um, uh, you know everything laid out so thank you all thank you thank you david it's a very important point uh, so thank you for making that uh, but uh yeah conscious of time so we do have one last poll we're going to put to you just as we start to wrap up and we're just going to ask you would an information portal of education and guides about the single trade window be useful for your business uh, the options are yes no not sure and just while people are answering that poll, Kevin, we've had another question come in from Nikki, and I guess another thing we've not talked about so much yet, particularly in the international context, is around standardization. Uh, so Nikki says, is the intention for a standardized format of information to be used so that exports and customs around the world can be easily accessible uh, and, and so on? It's, I mean, how important is, is data standardization in all this? Yeah, again, <clears throat> thank you for the question, and, and, it's a, and it's a really, really important observation. In our view, the, the greater the level of, of uh, standardization, the better. So clearly, global organizations like, uh, uh, like UNCFACT and the Institute involved in several initiatives, including one on transit with uh, UNCFACT, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the WTO, the World Customs Organization, and so on, standardization is, is absolutely essential. So um, uh, clearly, um, in in a supply chain, you, you need a certain level of data that's needed. Wouldn't it be great if um, if there was uh, both interoperability, but also agreement on 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 the standards? And I think, as as John said earlier, uh, there's things like like mutual recognition agreements, bilateral agreements that can actually take place. So we have the opportunity opportunity here to create that standardisation. Because there is a certain level of information that's required for origin, for classification, for customs valuation, and so on. So if we can create that standardization across all different types of trade, uh, certainly across transit, for example, but also uh, uh, across things like product certification labeling, it would make the world a lot easier. And again, your views, whether that's in a survey or taking part in our industry panel, are absolutely essential. And, we're working on several initiatives on single trade window. We've, we, we've talked around Kenya, but also there's, there's other uh, countries like, like Uganda, for example, Australia, where, where there's various initiatives there where uh, <clears throat> reusing data and standardization has tremendous benefits. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer. Uh, terrific, as always. Uh, just going to share the result of the poll. Uh, this may be some too surprising. 92% of you would like uh, that information portal. 8% of you not sure, and 0% of you saying no. So that's uh, revealing as ever. But on that note, we are running slightly over time. So on the last slide, uh, we'll start to wrap things up. I just want to say thank you once again to Kevin, first of all, for the presentation earlier and for being with us throughout the webinar. I'd like to really thank John and Tiago for sharing their ex expertise and experience 
during the first panel, some really uh, valid points there and great to hear about the Brazilian experience as well. Uh, thank you to Sylvia, David and Jane for sharing their views from the underground business perspective. I hope you all agree that's been a really fascinating discussion today and we'll ensure we continue to put on events like this one as the single window program develops uh, in the coming months and years. Before we go, a reminder of the survey mentioned earlier where you can share your views about what you'd like to see from a single trade window. The link for completing this will be shared with you by email following today's webinar, along with a copy of the slides and the recording of the, of the webinar. So thank you in advance for answering that. Again, we are very much taking your views to government, so please do participate. Please do get in touch if for any reason that follow-up email doesn't come through to your main inbox, we'll send it to you directly. Before then, though, uh, there's a smaller, shorter exit survey to come beforehand as you leave the webinar. So do let us know what you thought of today's webinar and any suggestions for future topics. But for now, thank you for joining us today. Thank you again to all of our panelists, and I hope you have a great rest of the week. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.